Good afternoon to everybody and a warm welcome to the many Africa Center alumni who have joined us today for this webinar on transnational organized crime entitled Natural Resource Crimes and Border Governance in Africa. My name is Dr. Catherine Lena Kelly and I am the Associate Professor of Justice and Rule of Law here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. I am the faculty lead on countering transnational organized crime and I'm also pleased to be the moderator of this webinar this morning or this afternoon for many of you. Uh, first, a few words on this series of webinars. Thank you to everyone across the Africa Center alumni community who has joined us. This is the first webinar of an occasional quarterly series that we are holding about transnational organized crimes of various sorts and their implications for border security, border management, and border governance. We hope to catalyze discussions that supplement conversations and policymaking processes that have already been started with the release of the 2020 African Union Strategy for Integrated Border Governance. And that strategy has five pillars that are quite wide ranging and that we will discuss holistically um, in a concluding session of the series. But overall, throughout this series, we're aiming to look in depth and with rigor at a small slice of these border governance issues, specifically as they relate to transnational organized crime. So we are seeking to convene scholars and practitioners who are experts on particular criminal markets that are part of transnational organized crime, like we have today for our discussion of natural resource crimes. And we're asking those scholars and practitioners to help us analyze the ways that security sectors can use tools for integrated border management um, and inclusive border governance to effectively counter crime. So this relates to a small part of the broader AU strategy and touches on border governance themes that are gaining attention as potential strategic solutions in the security arena. So once again, welcome to everybody from the alumni community who has joined us. We encourage you to share your experiences and um, ask your questions as well. Um, with that, let me turn it over to Dan Hampton, uh, the director, to speak a bit about the Africa Center itself. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and a warm welcome and happy new year. Bonjour à tous. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today for this important webinar series that we're starting on border security and transnational organized crime. As Dr. Kelly mentioned, I am the Deputy Director here at the Africa Center, and I'm pleased to be joining you, our family and friends, our alumni network, and other friends of the Africa Center today for this webinar. If you're wondering why I'm speaking to you as the Deputy Director rather than Kate umquist Knuff, if you have not heard, Kate's tour of duty has finished at the Africa Center after seven and a half years of exemplary service, and we miss her and we miss her leadership. Uh, the process is ongoing right now for the selection of a new director, and we will keep you updated through our alumni network communications as this progresses. But thanks again for joining us, and I'm pleased to be with you this morning for this introduction. I know many of you, since you are alumni and family and friends of the center, uh, you're familiar with what we do, but I just wanted to restate uh, who we are exactly and why we exist. We were established by our Congress and funded by our Congress for the study of security issues relating to Africa <clears throat> and serving as a forum for research, communication, and exchange of ideas. And how we achieve that mandate is through our mission statement, which is to advance Africa security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. And there's really three pillars within the Africa Center to get at that mission statement. The first is our academic affairs and programs, like what you're participating in today, this webinar series, and other events, who I know many of you attended as alumni. Second is our research publications and strategic communications. If you're not already very familiar with our website, africacenter.org, I encourage you to go there and use it as a resource. All our publications are posted on that website in PDF form, uh, in French, English, and many in other languages like Portuguese and Arabic and a few in Amharic as well. 
Also, we do spotlight pieces, which are like blog pieces on current topical issues and trends in Africa. And there's just a wealth of resources on our website. So please, if you're not using our website as a resource, uh, do so. And then the third pillar of our organization is our community alumni affairs and our outreach. And that's really where you come in. We want you to be part of our team, part of our family. We want this to be a two-way street. We communicate with you and you communicate with us. We want your relationship with the Africa Center to be beneficial for you and your career and your future as you move forward and stay connected with us. We're serious about that. And we want you to be part of our organization and feel that they're, we're there for you. If you remember in the mission statement I just read, the last part about catalyzing strategic solutions, that's where you all come in. We hope that the information that you hear today and from the excellent panelists that we bring in, and more importantly, from the discussion among you all in the question and answer session, that it helps you look at the job that you're in and the roles that you do, and you can catalyze those strategic solutions and make a difference for strengthening and building strong institutions that are accountable to the citizens of your country. So again, a warm welcome. Thank you very much for taking the time. I know everyone has busy schedules and busy days. And for you to commit your hour, hour and 15 minutes to us to participate in this webinar, we greatly appreciate it. So thank you very much, Dr. Kelly. I'm excited and eager to listen to this topic today and the great panelists you have lined up. Thank you very much for the work you've put into it. Great, thank you so much. So we'll get to it. The objectives of today's webinar are threefold. We hope to provide some understanding of the key actors involved in natural resource crimes, their incentives, and the ways they're making use of border spaces. We hope to explore the ways that natural resource crimes affect and involve border communities and how a range of local and national officials as well as non-state actors in those communities are responding to those crimes. And we will discuss the ways that security sector actors can use border governance frameworks to address some of these natural resource crimes. And let me finally introduce each of our distinguished panelists. Dr. Oluwole Ojawale is the ENACT Regional Organized Crime Observatory Coordinator at the Institute for Security Studies in Dakar, Senegal. He leads on improving the evidence-based knowledge and analysis of transnational organized crime and its impact on governance, development, and fragility in Central Africa. His ongoing studies focus on a wide range of different kinds of transnational organized crime, arms trafficking, oil smuggling, counterfeiting, timber trafficking, illegal fishing and mining, um, and illicit trading of strategic minerals. Dr. Ife Sinachi Okafor Yarwood is a lecturer at the University of St. Andrews, whose research to date has generated critical insights around the blue economy, environmental justice, human security, maritime governance, and security. She brings a critical lens to the concept of sustainable development in relation to the management of marine and other natural resources and challenges dominant assumptions on the areas of security, environmental justice, and maritime governance. Um, she has multidisciplinary research underway that investigates the complexities shaping environmental justice, natural resource governance, and security in Africa. And Brigadier General, uh, retired Brigadier General, Hayase Kangwe Ace Peke, holds a Bachelor of Science degree from University of Botswana, Lesotho and Swaziland, and a master's degree from Auburn University in the USA. In the Botswana Defense Force, he served in various capacities, ranging from an aircraft engineer to assistant chief of staff of personnel. And in addition, he has served in the office of the president as a coordinator for the Botswana National Security Strategy Review Project, which happened from 2007 to 2011. And afterwards, for several years, he worked part-time as a consultant in charge of the Security Sector Reform and Governance Program, for the Africa Public Policy and Research Institute in Pretoria. So welcome to each of our distinguished panelists. We're so excited to have you. With that, we'll begin the discussion, the moderated discussion. And first I will turn to Dr. Ojuwale. So Dr. Ojuwale, could you provide an overview of the degree and type of natural resource crimes in the Central African region using specific examples from your own research. Um, and if you could do that in about six or seven minutes, that would be great to start us off. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly. Thank you everyone for um, listening to me this morning in Dhaka. And then good afternoon to other participants from every other part of Africa who are probably ahead or behind. 
So uh, I think uh, it's interesting to note that uh, we can't talk about Central Africa without also touching on how these border crime cross over into East Africa and also overlaps with West Africa. Particularly when we look at the strategic positioning of Nigeria and then commodities that are being trafficked across the borders. So on that note, with the benefit of insight from my work, I will start from oil smuggling, which is a major crime in the Niger Delta part of Nigeria. And then in terms of statistics, the country, depending on who you are listening to, you, I mean, there's a range of figure, but I will speak from the perspective of the data available from the um, NNPC, the agency that deals directly with the management and oversight of uh, oil operations in Nigeria. So there is a data that says the country loses about 1.5 billion US dollar on a daily, on a monthly basis, as a result of um, um, illicit activities that have to do with um, oil smuggling. Um, and majority of the, of the trafficking of, the, of this commodity takes place across the border countries with Nigeria, particularly Cameroon, Benin Republic, and Niger Republic. So you have the illicit activities taking place within the Niger Delta, and then the oil passes through the waterways into Cameroon. And one of the factors that is actually enabling this is also the um, state security connivance within the process, because uh, the country has what is called multinational joint tax force, made up of the military, the police, and other relevant uh, law enforcement institutions. But corruption taking place within these actors who are also conniving with the people, particip the criminals engaging in this economy, this criminal economy is actually uh, one of the enabling factors. And there are evidences that shows the connivance of state security in this, in this regard from my studies and from the studies that others have carried out. So they were saddled by mandate to actually and prevent illicit trading or trafficking of oil. Um, and then in the process, they also find a way to carry out their own illicit business within the process. And then it complicates the matter and then the crime continues to, to fester. So that is one of the factors. The second factor is the fact that um, there's um, a stretch of, I mean, an expanse of borderline that is not adequately protected or that is not adequately manned by security operatives and um, in regular literature they call that um, ungoverned spaces. But from the studies that we've carried out, spaces become ungoverned not necessarily because security personnel are not present, but because they are also doing, engaging in the illicit business. And this is taking place across the border, whether from Nigeria, where I've mentioned that security actors are participating in the process, or at the other side, where there is also copious evidence in terms of the connivance of the state security actors on the part of Cameroon. So this is how oil smuggling takes place across the border from Nigeria and then to Central Africa. And one thing that is also very interesting for the evidence that I've gathered is the fact that uh, there are anecdotal evidences that shows that uh, the oil being traffic to Cameroon don't stay in Cameroon alone. There is evidence that is also getting into the hand of the rebel forces in Central Africa Republic. So it's a chain of network in terms of uh, what is being done with the oil that is traffic from Nigeria into Central Africa. And then the, the, another thing that is also very common in terms of commodity that has been trafficked from Nigeria to Central Africa is also timber trafficking. Cameroon forms part of the larger Congo Basin, which is the second largest rainforest reserve in the world. And then it's been treated by timber trafficking, which is taking place particularly in the north and southwestern part of Cameroon, which is very rich in this resource. So what you find out is that um, although there are, um, <clears throat> there are national responses, which are beautiful on the paper, but not sufficiently implemented, and the criminals have found a leeway in trafficking this product from, from Cameroon into Nigeria, and then shipping that into Vietnam, which has become a gateway to traffic timber products from, from West and Central Africa into Asia, into the Asian criminal market. So uh, it takes place within that dimension. 
And annually, in terms of statistics, Cameroon is losing about 60 million euro to, um, as a result of this timber trafficking. And it's also affecting the people within the border communities as well. There's a law in Cameroon that allows um, local community village people to engage in some form of lumbering at a very minimal level for the sake of livelihood support. But you find out that the criminal actors that are engaging in this process, they, they cut across everywhere and they jump into the forest and take away whatever is within their tree. So it's also threatening the, the livelihood of the local communities. The last aspect which I'm going to talk about in terms of the overview of my work in the recent time is going to be on the illegal fishing that is taking place on the Kivu Lake. Uh, within the past two or three years, as a result of um, a lack of bilateral cooperation, particularly in terms of waterway security and surveillance between, within the Great Lakes region in, in, in East and West Africa, the Rift Valley. So um, Kivu Lake is one of the major um, lake within the region. Although um, um, with limited fish resources, species resourcing, um, which is just about 29 species. Within the last two years, as a result of illegal fishing of the Kivu Lake, fish production has dropped by 28% within the last two years. And what is the factor that is enabling this? The enabling this as, uh, I think one of the factors that has been identified is as a result of bilateral security cooperation among the countries that are involved, particularly Rwanda and Congo. Rwanda is doing sufficient work in terms of uh, maritime policing and surveillance operation. But don't forget that the large expanse of the waterway actually stretch across the Congo, uh, the Congo land. And to the extent to which that cooperation is not there, illegal fishing continues to fester. Um, in the recent time, the, con the, two, the two countries have entered into bilateral agreements, which enhances them to carry out uh, different trade and then for, for trading and economic purposes um, in terms of tama generation on the Kivu Lake. But one area that has not been paid due attention to is how there's going to be an alliance in terms of cooperation between the two countries to address issues of illegal fishing on the Kivu Lake. So I think these are a few of, the, of my recent findings in the work that I've carried out in the Central Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Wale. Uh, for giving us that overview. Let me turn next to Brigadier General Peke. Uh, Peke, could you briefly describe the dynamics of poaching and wildlife trafficking in Botswana or the Southern African region, as well as some of the key actors who are perpetrating those kinds of trafficking? Um, we're hoping in six or seven minutes um, you could describe that and, and we'll get a sense of what incentives these actors have to engage with border communities to do some of that work. Good morning, Dr. Kelly, or good afternoon, everybody, participants, and my fellow colleagues. Uh, it is indeed an honor again to be participating in this webinar <clears throat> over such a, an important topic. Uh, let me start with uh, the dynamics as the question uh, proposes. And I think. Uh, to understand the dynamics of poaching in Botswana or even in the region, uh, one must first look at the geography and the ecosystem uh, of Botswana and our neighbors. <laughs> As we all know, we are a landlocked country. We share borders with uh, Namibia, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and to a little extent, uh, Zambia. <clears throat> Now, our borders with our neighbors are very long borders and very porous. Uh, we share 1,900 kilometers of border with uh, South Africa, and Namibia 1,400 kilometers, Zimbabwe 800 kilometers. <clears throat> and then the, an important point uh, is that up at the tip of our northern uh, border, there is a riverine border between us and Namibia. And the Caprivi Strip uh, extends from Angola and Namibia into a three-point tip that we share with Zambia and Zimbabwe uh, called the Caprivi Strip. <clears throat> now that portion 
of the northern tip is a riverine border where the Chobe and the Zambezi meet. So there's quite a, a long river and a border where people can access by boat into a, the Okavango Delta. Now, <clears throat> about 40% of Botswana's landmass uh, constitutes wildlife parks, uh, game reserves, and wildlife management areas. Now, if you contrast that to the small population of the country, which is only 2.2 million, it would suggest to you or show you that uh, out in these border communities, uh, they are very sparsely populated. The population density is very low. And therefore, that is one point that we must take into account when we look at uh, the poaching activities around these areas. <clears throat> So in total, if you look at uh, 105,000 square kilometers of land mass uh, being uh, game reserves or wildlife parks and wildlife management areas, then it poses quite a big challenge for the government to try and manage this kind of ecosystem. And uh, it's not too far-fetched to say that uh, the institutions that are tasked with this response are uh, poorly resourced to that effect. <clears throat> now, in, in the Chobe and the Ngami district, uh, the Okavango Delta, <clears throat> uh, studies uh, suggest that uh, because of the liberation wars that uh, emanated in the 60s and 70s, uh, to the west of Botswana, i.e. Angola, Namibia. Uh, these disturb the natural ecosystem, uh, wildlife ecosystems. And therefore, most of the animals uh, had to seek a safer refuge elsewhere. And most of them migrated into the Okavango Delta of Botswana. And so population-wise, we see many of these uh, big animals, the so-called big fives in the Okavango Delta in part of Zimbabwe. <clears throat> uh, the Okavango Delta is very rich in uh, elephants, uh, in buffaloes, in rhinos, and therefore they are very uh, attractive to poachers for their ivory, their rhino horns, or even game meat for that matter, and trophy. <laughs> so consequently, we see the Chobe and the Okavango Delta as hotspots for, uh, the, for poaching. <clears throat> and uh, when one travels down south towards Hansi and Kalahadi, there is still uh, serious poaching in these uh, two districts but a different kind of poaching uh, relative to the Northern part. In Khansi and Kalahadi, we see poaching being very rife for uh, cats, you know, lions, cheetahs, and uh, leopards, <clears throat> especially cubs of these uh, animals. <clears throat> uh, because one, I think they are easy to uh, capture and transport uh, they can bypass the uh, checkpoints, security checkpoints uh, to cross the borders. <clears throat> and uh, recently, perhaps about three or four years ago, there's a new phenomenon that has been observed, especially in the Kalahadi, Hansi and Kalahadi areas, where uh, there's a demand for lion bones. And interestingly, we used to have the, the Department of Wildlife used to have uh, what uh, they term these cats as problem animals. And uh, if these uh, animals are tagged, uh, say, livestock for farmers, then the farmers would report them to the Department of Wildlife, either to kill or relocate. But recently, they have since found a decline in this kind of reports because of this demand of uh, lion bones. Uh, what they would do is if the lions come in and attack their animals, they would then kill them 
and hide those bones for sale elsewhere outside the country. <clears throat> now, pangolins, again, in the Khansi and the Kalahari areas are also at, uh, at threat. Uh, you know, these are small docile animals that can be easily hidden uh, in vehicles. So we find uh, the trend again for pangolins uh, being posed for outer markets. <clears throat> Uh, now, the key actors, uh, the study suggests that uh, mainly uh, when these uh, poachers are, uh, uh, hand, uh, sorry, the, when these poachers come in and then uh, they, they get caught, uh, upon questioning, it usually comes out as uh, ex combatants or ex-military uh, personnel, or even mercenaries to a certain extent. <clears throat> and this is more evident because uh, when they are further questions, they have a very superior knowledge of the area, the terrain, and the tactics that they use. The mobility in this harsh terrain you know, suggests that they are people who have been uh, well-trained in terms of maneuvering in difficult areas. <clears throat> now, we've had a spate of rhino slaughter in this Okavango Delta between 2019 and 2021, especially in a place called uh, Mombo or Chiefs Island. And again, this bears testimony to this assertion that uh, primarily the, the ex-combatants uh, who have knowledge of the area who use sophisticated equipment because of the modern technology that they can afford that. <clears throat> but uh, for locals, it, it appears that there is, they are in the lower spectrum of the chain uh, because one, uh, they work for these middlemen either as guides or they would uh, naturally uh, go out to hunt for just for game meat for sustenance uh, in their uh, <clears throat> villages. <clears throat> and so we find that uh, the responsibility really is for high-end syndicates who control international markets. <clears throat> and uh, if one looks at uh, the organized crime index, some interesting figures come out. Uh, for example, the criminal market scores of South Africa is an average of six out of 10. And uh, Namibia is uh, 3.5, uh, Zambia is 4.6, Zimbabwe 5.2, and Botswana is 3.8. But if you look at that and then look at the markets, the fauna market itself, then the story becomes different because uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Botswana are at 7.5. That tops the, the, the criminal market, the fauna market. <clears throat> Whereas Namibia, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, sorry, and Angola are around 5 or 4.5. So the question is, why would uh, the poachers target uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Botswana, and not Namibia and Angola? then this kind of supports that earlier assertion that uh, the animals had really migrated to safer havens hmm. in their natural habitats. Yeah. 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 And then the criminal actor scores, again, it paints a, a very lofty picture. Uh, we find that Botswana is low at 5.5 uh, for criminal networks and five for foreign actors. Uh, Whereas South Africa is at 7 and 7.5 respectively, together with uh, Zimbabwe. <clears throat> and therefore, these figures show that uh, uh, comparatively, the locals are not so much into this business, except that uh, it's controlled by the criminal networks and foreign actors. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, a, a small percentage of uh, state, em state embedded actors. Uh, Botswana ranks at three, very low at three compared to other countries. For example, uh, South Africa is at 7.5 and uh, Zimbabwe and Angola are at eight. 
Uh, yeah. So yeah. we see that uh, indeed uh, it's mainly uh, criminal networks and foreign actors who are engaged in the foreign market for coaching. Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, let me let me give you um, maybe a, a minute to finish up, and then minute. I'll yes, say something uh, to the audience about the index that you're referencing as well, and then we'll move on to Dr. Ite. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, just a minute to wrap up on this. So we realize that the high demand in the Asian markets and globally, you know, the international wildlife trade commands about 120 billion US dollars. So that is a very high demand. And we find that poverty in the rural communities is a motivator for these communities to perhaps assist these big guys. And uh, the poorly resourced law enforcement agencies do not adequately match the sophisticated poacher uh, strategies. Uh, so cash may be a law hanging fruit uh, for to entice the, these communities. Uh, just to finish off, uh, let me share you a story that uh, in 2020, uh, there were poachers killed in the Okavonga Delta, three Namibians and one Zimbabwe. Uh, so in Zambian, who was purported to be a cousin of these three brothers. And last year in November uh, 2021, there was an inquest into these killings because uh, it was felt that uh, they were just uh, ordinary fishermen. And these kind of issues, uh, you know, stretch the bilateral relations that uh, countries have. But luckily, uh, the verdict of that inquest was out this morning. And the Botswana Defense Force was absolved of any uh, wrongdoing in that regard, nor any liability for criminal litigation. Yes, so for now, I'll uh, stop there, Dr. Kelly. And I will... Great. Yeah, thank you for sharing um, this, um, these uh, broad, um, this, this information first about the geography and the ecosystem, as you said, that gives us a lot of context about then some of these broad trends that you've described um, in the region. And, and um, certainly let me just um, say as a side note to our members of our audience who aren't familiar with the INACT Organized Crime Index, which is the index that um, Brigadier General Peke was talking about and giving those numbers from um, and analyzing for us here. Um, there, I think we have pasted a link to the index, uh, the OC index in the chat, um, but it's an index that looks at all African countries um, that um, is looking at different aspects of organized crime, um, the different um, intensity um, and um, presence of different criminal markets in different African countries, um, the extent to which different types of criminal actors are active, perpetrating different kinds of transnational organized crime in each African country on the continent. And then it also looks at 12 different resilience factors. So different factors that contribute to African states or society's ability um, to uh, become um, or remain resilient to some of these um, threats and some of these security challenges that come out of organized crime. And, I know Dr. Wale is um, probably um, in the thick of being part of uh, producing that index. It comes out, so far it's come out every two years for Africa. So there's a 2021 version and a 2019 version and could be just a useful tool for some of our alumni who are interested in looking at these dynamics for their country or neighboring countries uh, and so on. Um, so just a side note for context there, um, but um, not to derail us too much from our um, current discussion, let me go to Dr. Okafor Yarwood for about six or seven minutes. Could you please describe general trends involved in illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing in the Gulf of Guinea? Again, I'm talking about some of the key actors involved in it and how those actors are seeking to interact with coastal communities and use coastal territory to do their work. Um, thank you so much for the question. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, so to begin, I'd like to first define IE fishing as all fishing that breaks fisheries laws and regulation or, or call outside their reach. And for us to make better sense of who is doing what, I also think it's important for us to maybe classify the fisheries sector. So 
The fisheries sector is categorized into the um, industrial, which is usually um, distant water fishing nation, at least in the context of the African continent, mainly vessels from distant water fishing nations or vessels from the African continent, but have links with distant water fishing nations. And then we have the artisanal small scale fisheries, which is mainly done by um, local fishers and very close to the inshore area. A lot of the times it could be from zero to five nautical miles or zero to 12 nautical miles, depending on the country. And now let's talk about some of the trends. At the continental level, the extensive nature of illegal unreported and unregulated fishing is such that it amounts to 45% of the legally reported catch. At least this is according to a report by AU IBA in 2016. Also using their data for Western Central Africa, since I'm focusing on the Gulf of Guinea region, in Central Africa, it amounts to 44%, and in West Africa, it amounts to 53%. Based on this same data, it, it then means that the West African region have the highest level on the African continent of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, which is obviously um, problematic. And so IU fishing manifests in different forms. And in speaking about the forms, I will also try to sort of integrate or show you how this aligns with some of the, um, the strategies or the expectations of the African Union Buddha strategy and the pillars, and also highlighting why it's very important, at least some of the points that they make. So one of the ways that IU fishing manifests, especially by the industrial vessels, is that it is committed by vessels that have the legal um, fishing license or have legal agreement with coastal states to exploit resources in their exclusive economic zone. So they have the right to be there. However, this form of IU fishing happens when the vessels encroach the inshore areas, which is the inclusive economic zones that has been reserved for the artisanal fishers. And this, is something that is uh, very problematic and is on the rise in West and Central Africa and indeed across the African continent because the line between inshore area and territorial waters or the line between that and the area that the vessels can exploit is blurred. And so in recognition of this complexity, um, pillar two, um, objective two of the African Union border strategy noted that one of the objectives is to clearly delineate and demarcate and reaffirm all ter ter terrestrial and maritime boundaries. And one example that I want to share, and I also think that this example also then help us to see who potentially the actors are. And I think I can go on to say that a lot of the times um, the vessels that have been implicated for engaging in IU fishing in Western Central Africa in recent times are predominantly vessels from China, South Korea, vessels from Russia, vessels that have links with Japan, and vessels that have links with um, European Union. And this also all somehow helps us understand the difference between you know, the, the kind of crime or the non-state actor nature of a crime that my colleagues have alluded to. The difference, however, is that in this case, IEU fishing, given that a lot of the times these vessels are able to be on the African continent or in the countries in Western Central Africa to exploit resources, thanks to the subsidies they receive from their government, you can actually then go as far as saying that this sort of crime is a state-sponsored crimes because without the subsidies, they wouldn't have been able to get there in the first place. Without the subsidies that, um, necessitated or facilitated the agreement, they wouldn't have been there in the first place. So you could actually go as far as saying that this is the sponsor's crime, sponsored crime. So one of the examples I want to share with you that helps us um, understand the importance of this border strategy and some of the objective is the fact that in 2019, some NGOs led by the coalition by fair fishing agreement in 2019 made a complaint to the Directorate General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, DG Mare of the European Union, they complained or argued that Italian vessels were able, at least six Italian vessels, were able to fish illegally, that is encroaching the inshore areas in Sierra Leone, where they have um, authorization to fish through the Sustainable Fisheries Partnership Agreement. So they made this complaint in the hope that obviously action can be taken because the Italian government have not taken any action. 
However, in 2021, the DG Mares legal team responded to their um, query, noting, and I read this excerpt, it said, no legal activities of the operators can be proven in this instance. Their reason, the lack of exact nautical maps for the limitation of Sierra Leone IEZ creates difficulties in identifying actual illegal activities. And so, I mean, in law, you could say that this can actually set precedent because it means that any other vessel, uh, any other vessel from this water nation that's been accused of IE fishing or encroaching IEZ could actually say, well, we can't, you can't really say this because the lines are blurred. And so this example, I feel, should be something that motivates coastal states across the African continent and indeed in Western Central Africa too, if they haven't thought about it already, to start talking about clarifying their maritime boundaries and having clear delimitation, because this is one of the ways to at least ensure or combat IU fishing of this form. And then we have another form of IU fishing, which is true transshipment. And this is where there is interaction between the vessels or the industrial vessels and local communities. Because a lot of the times for this um, transshipment to be effective, you need to work with local fishers. And so for example, in Ghana, we have the practice where they, that they call cycle. And this involves um, industrial vessels selling their fish or illegally caught fish to boats that is waiting at, on, on the high sea. And this is very um, um, perversive in Ghana. We also have this sort of uh, transshipment happening in countries like Nigeria and Sierra Leone. But the difference, however, is that where they are caught elsewhere, it might be present whereby um, the artisanal vessels are the ones that are selling fish or giving fish to the industrial vessels waiting at the high sea. And we have example from Sierra Leone, for example, for instance, when they were supposed to be observing closed season, the industrial vessels were supposed to be observing closed season. It was reported that artisanal vessels were actually transferring the fish to them at the high sea, which more or less invalidates the whole idea of closed season to allow the regeneration of the pleating fish stock. I've already talked about the country, the some of the countries are uh, or come on, some of the countries implicated for IE fishing, but also there's this form of IE fishing that are called wherein vessels or vessels that do not have any fishing agreement at all are able to illegally fish in another country's IEZ. And this happens, for example, vessels from China, Korea, European Union countries such as Spain or Italy or Greece. This is just an example that might have license to fish in say Sao Tome and Principe. They have that agreement of fishing license to fish in Sao Tome and Principe, but do not have any license to fish in Nigeria's EEZ. However, they are able to encroach. Again, this is then this whole complexity of, is it by accident or is it intentional? But then when you see a trend, if you're observing the vessel monitoring system and you see a trend that this happens quite often, and then you could say that this is actually not an accident, this is intentional. You're going from one country where you have a license to fish to another country's EEZ where you don't have license to fish. And so this is also another example of um, IE fishing, which is actually, this is um, something that is very, a big problem for Nigeria because it doesn't have agreement with any distant water fishing nation to fish, um, but there are so many vessels that's been able to encroach into its EEZ to fish illegally through the agreement they have with the adjacent countries. And then at the artisanal fishing level, we have IE fishing. And in recent times, unfortunately, when you engage with fisher folk, the first thing they tell you is, well, I am just following the fish. And a lot of the times they don't actually tell you that they are doing anything illegal. If you understand, I'm trying to focus only on IU fishing that involves um, moving from one border to another and not necessarily IU fishing that requires using um, illegal tool, for instance. And so, unfortunately, because of the fact that they cite depletion and low catch as a justification for, you know, doing everything they can or following the fish, they now go as far as other countries to fish. So for Nigerians, they might go to Cameroon. For Cameroonians, they might go to Equatorial Guinea. For Senegalese, they might go to Mauritania. 
and for Senegalese as well, they might go to Guinea-Bissau. And unfortunately, this is increasing conflict between um, the, the law enforcement in those countries and the fisher folk resulting in clashes. And so this actually then reiterate the significance and the relevance of this AU border strategy and some of the pillars and the objective that it has outlined. It shows that there's a recognition for, you know, trans-border cooperation as the only solution to stem the ties of some of this problem, given its complexity. But at the same time, it also raises question about coherence because the AU is not short of strategy. We have the AIMS, African Union um, Maritime Strategy 2050. We have so many other strategies, but the question is um, a way to avoid replication and also bringing everything together to make sure that it works in the long term. Okay. To finalize, I will wonder just for us to understand the the you know the the impact in terms of the economic impact is not the most important thing, but I think it's also important to highlight the economic impact of IU fishing, and maybe that would also help us make sense of why it's important to address it. According to the AU IBA research from 2016 that I cited earlier, they noted that um, the cost, or should I say, the lost opportunities cost and the cost of um, stock rehabilitation from 1980. Um, 1980 to 2016 for the African continent is $326 billion. In West Africa is 24, sorry, in Central Africa is 24.9 billion. And in West Africa is 137.9 billion. This is a lot of money. This is more than the GDP of Ghana, of Kenya, of Angola, of Benin Republic, of so many countries, and something that they can actually afford to do. And this tells us, you know, the extensive nature and the economic impact. We haven't even talked about the human impact. Um, thank you so much for listening, and thank you so much for the question again. Yes, thank you, Dr. Ife, for giving us um, many a, a discussion of many different ways that IOU fishing can be happening and um, giving us um, some good examples from different countries in the Gulf of Guinea area um, to, to back those up and, and for relating this to the strategy. Um, I think we'll go for a second round of questions now with our panelists, but we're also, I, to prevent us from running too short on time to have questions from the audience, I'm gonna ask each of our panelists in this round to be a little bit quicker. Uh, quicker than planned, um, so maybe four or five minutes at most, just so that we, I see questions are coming in already from many of the rich um, present parts of the presentation that have come through already, so we want to make sure we have time for that. So going on the second round, shorter time, um, Dr. Wally, let's come back to you. Um, how can borderland development, cross-border cooperation, the engagement of border communities, help to enhance African state responses to different natural resource crimes. Um, we know, as you've said already, that resources like strategic minerals, oil, timber, play really important roles in border community economies. So um, what is your take on how um, engaging border communities can help enhance African state response to some of these issues? Well, I think uh, this question is trying to look at uh, local resilience on the part of the people in and enhancing whatever state's response that might be put in place by national, bilateral, and multilateral um, frameworks um, within the African continent. But these cannot be answered in isolation without also talking about the, the state of the border communities, um, how resourceful they are, how resilient they are, and also vulnerability of those local communities, which is occasioned by poverty, because um, they naturally are supposed to be the custodian of these commodities, but they have also become um, conscripted in terms of uh, participating in the criminal economy because of their vulnerability, which has to do with the incident of poverty in some of those communities. So you find a situation whereby they themselves have become smugglers who are either of trafficking of minerals, particularly where you look at the Great Lakes region, Congo in particular. So that in a way, because of the, uh, what I will refer to as a limited statehood in terms of um, organizing those communities, in terms of uh, exerting state presence in those places, particularly spreading um, economic development in those places. 
These people have no other option. They have no other area to look into, apart from also tapping into these commodities in those, in those um, uh, communities. So it becomes a hot commerce affair for both the criminals and then people who think they are doing legitimate business, particularly when you look at artisanal operations and participation in these commodity markets uh, at the local level. So I think in terms of uh, community uh, response, uh, what we have seen um, has been very, very low because they also need to participate in that criminal economy. But I am not one of those people who are going to criminalize those people for participating in the process. And it's not that I say I'm saying it's a legitimate business. It has to be viewed from a whole of a society approach and a whole of a government approach. If you look at the instance of, a, um, uh, of course, if you look at the Niger data crisis, for instance, uh, if you look at how it has festered over time, to the extent that those who were engaging in illegal hoiball cream originally, um, there, are, there is now sufficient evidence that they have also taken to transnational organized crime, even participating on the high seas, um, um, piracy and all sorts of uh, activities that are taking place. It took years of government neglect, negligence for us to arrive at that point because government needs to uh, exert the full weight of monopoly of violence uh, to be able to um, keep these criminals at check. And it is when those things were lacking that then you start seeing the rise of warlords across these communities that are also supposed to be probably providing information that could be processed into intelligence, which the government is going to act upon. I think that is a major challenge that we've had. But in terms of um, cross-border cooperation, of course, states are, um, are rising to that. And I think um, we are seeing sufficient evidence. <laughs> Hardly will a quarter of a year pass without seeing one or two countries coming together, either to sign agreement on drug trafficking, on timber trafficking, or on commodity trafficking generally. But I think the way the challenge lies is in the fact that um, uh, it's not enough to develop documents. Document needs to be, I mean, need to be domesticated, rectified, and then funded adequately. I think in terms of funding, that is where uh, cross-border cooperation has been limited. And then when you look at um, the needed technology, the, ne ne the needed equipment and tools to be able to prosecute um, arrests, um, it, it's becoming difficult because such surveillance is not put in place. It is easier for a criminal to engage in a crime in DRC and cross over to Congo, I mean, to, to Rwanda, and then that is the end of it. You don't see so much of these um, multinational joint force operation, uh, in, uh, bilateral partnership and engagement enforced when it comes to this dimension of cross-border cooperation. And then I, I think what is also very, very important is the fact that, um, um, like the earlier speakers have said, there's a need to frame the solution around this whole cross-border crime from a continental perspective, from a regional perspective, and uh, because they cross across the border. So rather than each country working in silo, and the police operators in Nigeria must not work, and then you get Cameroon is not working as it ought to be. Any moment anybody commits crime in one of the country, then it becomes easier the moment the person cross over to the other country. And then one of the factors that is also very important, although very, very indigenous, is that maybe most people are not paying attention to, is the balkanization of the continent originally about 60 years ago. There are people who live across the border who are of the same kindred. So it is easier for somebody probably to leave from Nigeria and cross over to Bakasia mix with the people and then commit crime. And then um, there is no, uh, the, 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 the geographical, the homogeneous nature of those communities, even though they are partitioned into two different countries, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it, it, it is not going to abet crime. That is the reason why you look at issues of um, maybe um, smuggling that is happening across Nigeria, in Niger, Cameroon border. It, this homogeneity of those communities has already provided a platform for people to be able to cross over without having maybe any, any form of identity to be able to uh, maybe ide identify themselves. So I think we are living at a very good time that if we are talking about African continental free trade area, 
one of the things that is also very, very important is that um, it's not enough to talk about those things without providing and without providing sufficient uh, multilateral support that is going to check transnational organized crime in those dimensions. I think that is what is very, very important that um, probably because the hands of um, regional bodies and uh, continental bodies are full now, but these things cannot be treated in isolation. If you come to West Africa, for instance, issues that we have raised might not be on the front burner for government now. They are chasing yeah. the issues of um, field coup in Burkina Faso, coup in Mali, coup in Guinea, ensuring that democracy is not, um, is not a democratic uh, values, democratic achievement is not eroded. But these are critical issues. If you look at the statistics that the earlier speakers have also raised here, it shows that uh, we have a, a, a major challenge at hand. And if indeed they cross the border, um, it, it, it's the one government cannot solve the solution alone. There's yeah. a need for that multilateral partnership. And then wherever any country that, that is ready to be a signature to a, to, to a document must also be ready to put its money where those documents are going to be adequately financed. So yeah. you have a situation whereby it is only a few countries who are making those sufficient input in terms of financial resources being committed to addressing these issues of border crime. Uh -huh. But so what is also very Dr. important Dr. is the outcome. Yeah. I'll, I'm sorry, I'll have to cut you off there just because I want to make sure we have time for some of these questions and what you're saying, I think, will catalyze a lot of questions mentioning the free trade, the continental free trade agreement and, um, you know, cross-border cooperation. So I'm um, sorry to have to cut you off, but let's let's move to um, very briefly in maybe two or three minutes, uh, Brigadier General Peke. I know there won't be time for you to present everything we planned, but maybe you could give us one example from your work um, showing how the security sector could engage local government officials, non-state actors, and other citizens and border communities to address poaching and some of these natural resource crimes. I know you had a good example um, from uh, your work that maybe you wanted to share. So if you could just take, I don't know, two or three minutes to briefly give us that so that people have a, a, a flavor of, of what your response is to that question. Okay, Dr. Kelly, I'll try and uh, rush through it. Uh, I think uh, for your question, we can look at two approaches. Uh, one is that uh, there's a multi-sectoral approach uh, by government institutions to try and uh, address this uh, problem. Uh, there are law enforcement committees at district level uh, which are managed by district commissioners. And these district uh, law enforcement committees comprise, uh, for example, uh, members of Botswana Defense Force, the police, prison services, Botswana Unified Revenue Services, Department of Wildlife and National Parks. Uh, literally key stakeholders in this regard uh, participate in such a uh, uh, law enforcement committees. <clears throat> and within these law enforcement committees, there are what they call technical advisory committees, again, made up of a few members from each of these institutions. And their primary role is to work closely with community trusts uh, to assist them in operationalizing uh, their respective projects. Uh, <clears throat> because you'll find that uh, the literacy levels that these communities is somewhat a, a challenge and the entrepreneurial skills are almost next to nil. The financial literacy as well is very low. So these uh, technical advisory committees work with these community trust in whatever project they've decided to uh, embark upon. Uh, <clears throat> uh, now, there is also the community-based natural system re uh, resources management. And under this uh, theme, uh, for example, we have a, one community which uh, harvests devil's claw, uh, which is a, an essential commodity that the Germans uh, used to harvest and export to make a health and medicinal purposes. Now it's uh, done locally to produce such uh, medicines. <clears throat> uh, in one area, there's a community that uh, uh, mine salt from the boreholes because the underground water is very salty. So they engage in mining the salt, you know, bringing up uh, underground water and then evaporating it uh, salt. There is also coal production and uh, livestock feed, 
from uh, an encroaching uh, bush in the Kalahari South. And uh, that uh, also is working very well. <clears throat> but uh, sometimes the intended purpose really seems not to work well uh, for, for this uh, community trust, like I've said, uh, either lack of the entrepreneurial skills and then you find uh, this broad misappropriation of funds. <clears throat> uh, in another area, there is what is called a justice forum, where these law enforcement uh, uh, officers meet with members of the justice department, because by far and large, we find that cases of wildlife uh, poaching are uh, not given the desired effect. Sometimes they take very long in the uh, record management systems of the justice. Uh, in certain cases, the judgments or the sentencing is inappropriate uh, purely because of the differences in interpretation and how strong this means to, 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 to the local communities. Uh, in that regard, some people all, uh, prefer or would recommend that there should be a distinct uh, green courts specifically for uh, this kind of uh, business where we find that uh, it's going uh, haywire. Mm -hmm. uh, and in some instances, perhaps uh, the Department of Wildlife and National Parks could be uh, privatized or even become a parastate. That uh, perhaps could be. The other thing is that uh, there are uh, bilateral interventions where these communities, uh, these committees work hand in hand with neighboring uh, committees. And on a quarterly basis, they would patrol the borders, uh, meet at a certain point, and exchange notes uh, on the way forward. Uh, I, I, I've had occasion to witness such a uh, a border patrol between Botswana and South Africa at the Kalahari Transfrontier Park. Uh, but having said that, uh, it, there is plenty of, you know, hanging questions with regards to this kind of uh, operations. Uh, I also witnessed a very disturbing kind of uh, poaching, which I would term self-inflicted by our government in that uh, these porous borders have not really been managed or to, to, to the extent that they can protect the animals. On an annual basis, there's an airland migration in the Kalahari uh, uh, South from the Transfrontier Park, our side, into South Africa. Because uh, what used to be uh, you know, fences protecting the animals from going has long been uh, broken down by sand dunes. And therefore, there's this free movement because animals are <clears throat> drawn into the Molopo escarpment along the borderline. The warm, moist air in winter attracts these animals. And because there's no uh, barrier, they just go across and into the open gates of the uh, South African farmers along those borders, and they are never seen coming back. Hmm. So that is uh, a big challenge. Okay. Regionally, uh, the SADC has uh, what they call a law enforcement uh, anti-poaching strategy, uh, 2015 to 2020, uh, which sets out guidelines for respective member states uh, to draw a leaf from in order to try and improve uh, the, the way forward for anti-poaching uh, operations. And I think uh, Botswana, uh, has borrowed that leaf. Uh, I know they are working on the anti poaching strategy for the director of wildlife and national parks. Okay. So, so, thank you. So, General Park, yeah, I'm you sorry to have to stop you, um, but it's I'm glad that you were able to get to the point of mentioning um, the leaf strategy um, and how Botswana is um, working on it. Um, and um, thank you for all of these other examples as well of different ways on the local level um, that. Um, the, this might be dealt with or that um, you've tried in Botswana and some neighboring countries. Um, I'm sure that will be fodder for lots of good discussion. Um, and Dr. Ife, I'm sorry to have to rush you as well on our second question, but if you could just take um, two or three minutes and maybe just give us one example from what you were going to present about what kinds of border community engagement or governance approaches were useful for building coastal community resilience to organize fisheries crime. 
Um, and I know we had planned for you to talk maybe a bit about roles of women in there. So whatever you can do in about three minutes, and then I think we'll we'll go to uh, at least one round of questions and maybe if, if the panelists are amenable, extend the time by a tiny bit, maybe five or 10 more minutes to do questions. So um, okay. over to you for about three here. Okay, um, I'm gonna be quick and say that uh, the Western Central African um, side of things, um, there's a sub-regional advisory bodies um, for instance, Fisheries Committee for West Central Gulf of Guinea, we have the sub-regional fisheries commission that is based in Senegal. We also have um, such bodies in Central Africa that in terms of the term resilience, they are working together, at least maybe not necessarily at the community level, but working with um, regional or countries or member states to be able to, for example, share information and share data and also then be able to maybe help them a step further to identifying vessels that might have previously been able to commit IE fishing, say in one country, say Benin Republic, and then go to Cote d'Ivoire and commit the same crime undictated. But the fact that they are now sharing information, they're now sharing data and there are monitoring systems that they can do this have meant that they've been able to identify these things but this is at the state level because this is state institutions like fisheries organization at the community level um unfortunately i think that it's something that in recent times anyways that they are beginning to recognize that um CSO, that is civil society organizations and community have a role to play in, um, play in, um, in sort of building resilience to some of the vulnerabilities. But before I go further, I want to, I definitely want to problematize the use of a term resilience because it, it sort of resonates with some of the points that have been made by previous speakers in talking about how communities or people are having to, you know, do what they can to make ends meet due to the absence of the state in terms of providing that social goods. And so it is problematic because it romanticizes the population's ability to navigate some of the adversities, some of the impact of the church we've talked about as having supernatural abilities to do this devoid of the support from the state. Because I mean, it's basically that they are doing what the state should be doing. And I think this is why I wanted to highlight this point about resilience. However, we also see communities coming together, you know, coming together um, to do things, doing literally everything with nothing, filling the gap positively um, in terms of what the state is not able to do for them. So, for example, in terms of women organization, we see that they have limited ability to institutional um, financial of commitment because of the irregular form of uh, their business. And so what they do is they come together and form cooperatives and able to contribute money among themselves. And then they can then use that money and lend to the next person, which would then be used to improve their business. And the fact that a lot of the time, these women are also the ones that invest in the fishing activities of the men. It means that women are playing a very important role in ensuring that men that might not necessarily be employed, that might be upset and desperate to make ends meet, do not go into crime because they provide that money and they can invest it in the fishing activity of the men. These are some of the positive ways. And we also see increasingly NGOs that are coming up. We also see some of the corporations or, or should I say co um, cooperatives also starting farming activities so that in the low season, they can do the farming and then harvest it in the low season, which means that by the high season, they do the farming again and low season, they can harvest this. This bridges the gap between not having enough and then being tempted to engage in illicit activity. And one thing I can say about how the state is present here is that at least in recent time, I have seen um, projects like the support for or uh, support to integrated maritime security in West Africa, which is the SWAMS EU sponsored project working within West Africa. I've seen and I have attended some of the, the, um, the webinars they've organized for communities, for them to share ideas on what they are doing differently, and also for them to explore ideas on how they can contribute to maritime security and safety. And I think that this is something that needs to be promoted if it's not already happening in other parts of the African continent, and something that should be strongly um, encouraged. 
On the negative aspect, unfortunately, and this has been alluded to by, by the previous speakers, there's also negative resilience because when people are desperate and they cannot do anything else, a lot of the time they might choose to um, go the route of illegal migration. And this is why we see a lot of people from Western Central African region leaving their countries, leaving the continent and doing everything desperately, not even minding dying on their way to get to Europe because they feel, well, this is the only option. In terms of the women, we see women in fisheries that um, the idea of uh, sex for fish is becoming something that is happening more often because they don't have money to pay for the fish and they might just get into this relationship with the man just to ensure steady supply. And with that, we see potentially increase in HIV. So something that started with just fish is more or less destabilizing the peace and, and, and stability of communities. We see people engaging in drugs trafficking, human trafficking, or giving their children out for child labor because they can't afford to feed. We see people acting as informants for criminals or for pirates. And I mean, this whole thing has a cyclic effect. And so when we talk about maritime threat, when we talk about this issue, even the border threats or trans-border threats, there's always something. And I feel that a lot of the times in more or less trying to bring it together with what previous speakers have spoken about. When there's state presence, I think that's actually one of the first steps towards solving this problem. But a lot of the time, in terms of the resilience bit, the state is not necessarily present, which is why we have to be careful about the way we chose the word resilience. resilience. Thank you so much. No, that's a great point about resilience and placing that word in proper context um, in relation to policy imperatives and sort of lived realities in relation to all of these different kinds of crime that we were talking about today. Uh, the question for General Pequet is the following. In terms of the um, crimes of uh, herds on the borders, are these, this is the question by a colleague from Mauritania. How does one deal with this? Um, so that's one question for General Pequet. Um, for Dr. Ojewale, um, uh, one question for you. You spoke to the challenge of security sector actors' complicity in enabling transnational organized crime. So what are your recommendations to address the root nature of these issues from the grassroots level up to the international foreign policy level? That's a big question for a short amount of time for you to answer, but I think um, uh, several, several questions to this effect um, came in about the security sector in particular. So we'll field that one to you. Um, it, there was also a small question about the IUU fishing you mentioned on Lake Victoria. Um, there's a question about, um, uh, let's see, there's been increasing conflict between law enforcement and artisanal fishermen on the Kenya-Uganda border within the lake. Is there any research on that you can recommend we look at? And then finally, um, for Dr. Okafor Yarwood, um, here is a question for you. There were two sort of like this. Um, how realistic is the strategy of the AU concerning fishing issues when we know that the organization that was created to fight maritime piracy in the Gulf of Guinea never took off? I guess this is somebody talking about the Interregional Coordination Center and asking about the role of the ICC, um, I guess, in the future of, um, you know, furthering some of these different strategies that we talked about, AIMS, or I guess this border government strategy as well. Um, uh, yeah, there were two questions that came in sort of about the synergies of all of these different centers and initiatives and strategies. So we'll do one round. Um, please uh, feel free to just take, um, I don't know, two or three minutes to answer your question. Um, I think um, we've captured quite a few that came in from the alumni, not all. So apologies to the alumni who asked a question that won't get addressed, but we've picked a couple of the top line ones here to get your sense on. So let's go in reverse order. Dr. Ife, let's go to you first. Um, thank you so much for the question. Um, I think um, in talking about how realistic is the African Union border strategy, um, given that others have not worked, I think that the only problem we have with the African Union border strategy is how can we ensure that it aligns with other existing strategy. Um, I do not agree that other existing um, strategies have not worked in terms of the example you gave with the Yaoundé um, architecture, for instance. So we have the Yaoundé um, Code of Conduct was signed in 2013. There were delays, but 
between 2017 when the Aounde um, um, architecture was operationalized to date, there has been significant improvement. Um, zone D, which is led by um, Cameroon, for example, obviously have existed before um, the architecture was operationalized. So maybe I shouldn't use that as an example, but we have Zone E, which is based in our headquarters in Benin Republic, where with Nigeria, Benin, Togo, as a Niger and, uh, and yeah, as part of the countries in that zone. We also have Zone F, which is headquartered in, in Ghana. For instance, they have been operationalized and they are doing very well in terms of sharing information. There are examples of that information being successful in, in, in leading to interdiction. In, 20, um, in 2020, we actually saw a specific example whereby information from the Ivorian Navy, for example, and the fisheries, um, fisheries agency in Ivory Coast was helpful due to the communication and, and helpful in, in final um, arrest of uh, the crews that the people that kidnapped crews from Hei Yun Feng, which of course with the support of the Nigerian Navy. So these are examples that the operationalization of the Yaounde Code of Conduct is effective. However, I have to say that unfortunately, some of the zones have not been operationalized, such as Zone A, which is supposed to be um, based in um, Rwanda, Angola, and Zone G, which is supposed to be based in Praia in Cabo Verde but there is vision for this to happen. Obviously, I'm sure you know about the complexities and um, previous speakers have talked about issue of funding, which is some of the challenges. So there are big problem with ensuring that everything is aligned in terms of you know, making sure you're not just waking up and introducing a strategy and not thinking about how it aligns with the previous strategy. But in terms of implementation, I think the example with the Aounde is not really a good example because it's actually evidence of things that are working although there are challenges. I hope this has helped. Thank you so much. I think Thanks. it has, and hopefully the person who asked the question does too. Um, General Peke, let's go to you for um, the question about um, cattle and the borders. All right, if, if I understood the question correctly, uh, what happens uh, uh, between borders uh, to deal with the crimes that uh, in those areas, uh, like institutions by neighbors share intelligence a lot. And uh, <clears throat> what happens is uh, uh, the customs department in Botswana, for example, will be constantly uh, uh, engaging the South African counterparts or Namibian counterparts. So in the event that uh, they've gathered certain intelligence that intelligence is shared amongst members. Uh, so for example, when I was out in Kalagadi South, uh, you know, there are about six small borders, uh, border posts in that area. And uh, the, the poachers are able to maneuver and just cross outside of those borders. But because of this intelligence sharing, uh, there were a couple of, uh, these poachers who were caught the other side of Botswana in South Africa, because uh, uh, it was relayed to them that there are certain suspects who did not cross at these border posts and they were apprehended and taken to task accordingly. I hope that answers the question. Great. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, and we'll go to Dr. Wole, um, finally, for the question on um, the security sector. And I see that you shared a study on the Kenya-Uganda IOU fishing element. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. A very difficult one, the first question is, in terms of um, how do we ensure that the, those who have the mandate to actually protect um, the countries, um, in terms of uh, security are not also the ones that are also enabling um, organized crime. Uh, to be simplistic, we will say there should be the need for deterrence, deterrence in terms of uh, administration of criminal justice, arresting corporate officers and trying them within the ambit of the enabling law, uh, probably nationally or regionally um, or otherwise. Uh, but it, uh, one thing that is very, very important and which I believe everybody that is uh, participated in this program will know is the fact that uh, TOC is an entrenched crime and it takes a network of actors to be able to participate and successfully execute um, an intent 
um, which is uh, an ongoing process. So um, what is easily doable is probably to say you want to arrest and prosecute the lower level officers who have actually uh, the feed operating, the feed, uh, who are engaged in the feed operations, but the big guys, I mean the big masters, who are seated in in offices and facilitating the, I mean the the, the bureaucratic criminal engagement in this entire value chain. Sometimes they are they are untouchable, but I think there is a political solution to that, and the political solution is that uh, until you see the rise of stronger institutions, which is going to be made possible by strong leaders as well at the political fronts. And I think it is at that level that we can actually adequately address issues of state security connivance in TOC at any level of operation. But when I talk about the, the dimensions of, of uh, engagement of the state security officials as well, uh, in the recent time, issues of ecocide is also being discussed to feature on, um, in, um, at the level of uh, international criminal justice in Hague. So to the extent to which anybody, entity, business organization, multinationals can be dragged and then prosecuted through the law at that level, I, I, I think uh, we are going to see sufficient response in addressing both lower level engagement, uh, connivance of security officials, and then top level engagement of security officials who are conniving uh, in, in this uh, TOC. I think if that um, engagement starts taking place, there is going to be some redress in the way. And people are going to be tried and then judiciously um, justice is going to be delivered. And then the issue of illegal fishing, uh, I think it's a big problem uh, within the Great Lakes region where you have Lake Victoria, Lake Albert, Lake Kivu Lake, and all these big lakes um, uh, within that region. And um, there, there are sufficient um, um, responses that we also seen on the part of the state security forces. I talk about my work, which is looking at strengthening uh, or engaging bilateral response between DRC and Rwanda. There's sufficient engagement on the part of Uganda and uh, Congo, and I believe uh, other countries are also being sufficient in that regard. So I think it's, it's an ongoing process. I've only uh, talked about a missing link, which I think is existing between Rwanda and Congo. But it doesn't mean that other countries are also not engaging uh, with respect to providing um, sufficient state solution to these issues, particularly a securitized uh, response. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of our alumni who asked a question. I hope that we captured at least some of them in this um, uh, round robin that we did with the panelists. Thank you um, to our alumni for joining us. And also I know some people were sharing different comments, which we've also saved up um, and we'll be able to um, process and share um, or and process and, and, and um, think about as we're continuing with this series. Uh, please join us also, join me also in thanking our three distinguished panelists for the brilliant um, interventions that they made for us today on this panel. Um, and um, I would encourage you to continue to follow this series with us. We would love for you to join us again. Our next iteration in this series on border governance and transnational organized crime will take place in May, and it will be on the subject of cattle rustling. Um, so we'll continue to pick up on some of the questions that were even asked in this round robin um, here today. Thank you very much to everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon or evening, wherever you are, or morning, and over and out.